Today we're going to be talking about the vampire in a medical perspective. Is this a myth or a malady? The vampire is a fascinating creature we have created that has captured man's imagination ever since its first descriptions. Throughout the years and all over the world, it has been portrayed in various and sometimes conflicting, but more often relatively similar ways in folklore books and movies. From Bram Stoker's Transylvanian Count Dracula to the Sasabonsam from West African folklore, the Manangal from the Philippines and the Maroi from Romanian legend. This image of the vampire gradually became more Hollywoodized in the last century, starting with the creepy looking Nosferatu to the punk rock teenage vampire Keeper Sutherland in Lost Boys to the heartthrobs in Twilight had everyone locking up their mothers, daughters and anything else with warm blood. Diseases that plagued our ancestors played a part in their creation. Diseases were frightening things before the age of medical science. Plagues, epidemics could appear without warning and cause death and misery throughout the land. It wasn't just plagues. Other diseases, perhaps passed on by animals or from genes lying dormant in their own bodies, could cause ailments that defied explanation. Centuries before sanitation, refrigeration and antibiotics Diseases were more prevalent and were far more likely to take people to an early grave. But without a microscope to study these tiny assailants, communities in older times instead turned to the supernatural to explain these many diseases. Some of these diseases helped spawn one of the most enduring and widespread monster myths in civilization, the vampire. Now imagine, pale skin, fangs, an unquenchable thirst for blood and the aversion to garlic and sunlight seem to be recurring elements across tales, books and movies. On closer inspection, the physical and behavioural features of the vampire show striking and intriguing similarities with a few relatively rare medical conditions. Now let's start with porphyria. Porphyria is a group of disorders caused by an excess of porphyrin. Red blood cells contain haemoglobin, which is a protein that carries oxygen and carbon dioxide around the body. Haemoglobin contains a carbon, nitrogen and hydrogen ring in the middle called a porphyrin ring and usually the body has specific enzymes to convert porphyrin into a molecule called a heme group. However, in porphyria the body has a deficiency in this enzyme causing a build up of excess porphyrin which can sometimes cause problems. The patients suffer itching, rashes, blisters every time their skin is exposed to sunlight. In the very worst and thankfully very rare cases, the gums receive from the teeth, making them appear far more prominent like fangs. Excess porphyrins also builds up in the teeth and mouth, causing a reddish brown discoloration, almost like they've been drinking blood. Their bodily waste takes on a purple hue like that of undigested blood and the effects of sensitivity to light can be so severe that sufferers lose their ears and noses, a physiognomy echoed in the looks of vampires such as Nosferatu. The classical aversion of the vampire to garlic may be accounted for by the ability of certain compounds of this bulbous plant to induce the heme degrading enzyme heme oxygenase 1, thereby further exacerbating the patient's anemia. Thankfully, there are probably no more than a few hundred of these severe cases in the entire world at any one time. But their incidence may have been greater in remote communities in medieval times, one which had less frequent contact with the outside world and a much less varied gene pool. The rural hamlets and farming villages in Transylvania, now part of Romania, fit this bill to a T. And it's from Eastern European regions such as Transylvania that the vampire myth spread westward. It's worth noting that most porphyrias are hereditary, which could easily lend further support to crazy stories and myths and rumours about a nest of vampires. Another disease which could be linked to the vampire myth is pellagra. Pellagra is caused by a dietary deficiency of vitamin B3 and niacin and an amino acid called tryptophan. Usually your body would use niacin to turn food into energy and if you weren't getting niacin your body would make niacin from tryptophan but a lack of either or both then things can take a turn for the worse. Now let's rewind a bit. Corn was first introduced from the New World, that's present day USA, in the 1500s and soon became the staple crop and food source for the poor peasants in Europe as it was easy to grow and cheap. 
but it wasn't very nutritious. Corn is also incredibly low in tryptophan, so there's nothing for the bodies to convert niacin into tryptophan, so people just couldn't get enough niacin. Photosensitivity is a hallmark of pellagra characterised by skin rashes and pale, paper-thin skin. Furthermore, erythematous glossitis and chelitis is often present, basically tongue swelling and a red mouth. And it's not hard to imagine the link between this symptom and fangs dripping with blood. Pellagra also causes neuronal degeneration in the brain, resulting in aggression and insomnia. This, combined with a sunlight allergy, may explain why our mythical vampires are awake all night and asleep all during the day. And due to scarce resources in former days, nutrient deficiency would seem an epidemiologically plausible explanation for the vampire myth. Most people in these communities kept animals. The villages themselves were usually close to forests and woodlands, which were home to many other animals. Before vaccination was discovered, rabies, now virtually unknown in the European wild, was common, and the rabies virus is typically transmitted through animal saliva. Once symptoms developed, including aversion to light and water, hyperaggression, bizarre or beastly behaviour such as biting and delirium, death was certainly inevitable. There is no cure. Hydrophobia, a symptom of rabies, is characterised by severe laryngeal muscle spasms in response to drinking or even seeing water, often accompanied by coughing up blood and exposing the teeth. Even one's own reflection could trigger laryngeal spasms, which might explain the vampire's fear of mirrors. The beastly biting behaviour of the infected patient, a means to transmit the virus, could explain how vampirism was transmitted from one person to another. Both this behaviour and the insomnia, which could explain the vampire's nightly escapades, are the results of dysregulation of the limbic system, an important and early site of neuronal damage and inflammation in rabies. As opposed to the rare forms of porphyria, rabies was a relatively common condition in former times. Now, both these diseases explain a few things, but is there anything else? What about immortality and being undead? Medical science was in such infancy in older times that even telling if a person had died wasn't exactly foolproof. Diseases such as catalepsy, which put people into a catatonic state so deep that their muscles completely seize up and their body seemingly goes into a stasis, with a pulse and respiratory rate that was hard to detect. This meant that some people were buried alive. If they awoke, some were driven so mad with fear and hunger that they would bite themselves, an explanation perhaps for some of the corpses found with fresh blood. If you saw someone climb out of his or her coffin and the earth he was buried in, I think it would be reasonable to jump to conclusions and not wait around. When calamity struck these rural areas, plagues, cattle dying, many would point the finger at undead spirits preying on the living, Often the first act would be to dig up the last set of people who had died in the village or town. The cadavers would likely look animated and alive. Longer hair, fingernails, bloated bellies and blood in the corner of their mouths almost as if they'd been commuting from their graves to feast on the blood of the living. What the misinformed people believed was an unholy reanimation was simply the normal biological process of death. Number one. When a body decomposes, the skin dehydrates, giving the impression of hair and fingernail growth. Number two, bacteria in our gut are involved in the process of putrefaction or decay, where gases such as hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide and methane are produced, thus increasing the pressure in our bodies and forcing out gut content and blood through the mouth. So there you have it, some medical explanations as to why people used to think unholy bloodsuckers stalk the earth at night. Now these conditions still exist but fortunately are avoidable and we have a wide array of treatment options and a greater level of medical and scientific understanding both by professionals and patients alike.